I believe we can all relate to it. You're eating your puffed rice and you realize they still aren't coated with metal. This issue that has been plaguing humanity for... for over 100 years will end today. In a previous video, I have coated different surfaces with metals like silver, chromium, aluminum, copper or titanium. To do that, I used a process called thermal evaporation, which as the name suggests, means that you heat the metal in a high vacuum chamber until it evaporates and then you can deposit it onto a surface. This method is awesome, but it has a few drawbacks. You, for example, can't deposit materials with a very high boiling point. Tungsten, for example, would be a metal you cannot deposit using thermal evaporation. The boiling point is simply too high. You also can't deposit materials like ceramics or, for example, indium tin oxide, which is used as a transparent conductive layer in, for example, mobile phones. To nevertheless be able to coat surfaces with these materials, a process called sputtering is used. Before I show you my home-built sputtering setup, let me first explain to you what sputtering actually is. Right here I have a vacuum chamber with a nice glass dome so you can see inside better. I have copper electrodes on either side of the vacuum chamber and I will connect a high voltage power supply to these electrodes. As you can see, as soon as I turn on the power supply, a plasma is forming inside the chamber. What is happening here is that electrons are hitting the residual gas molecules in the chamber, in this case mostly nitrogen, and ionize them. Those ionized gas particles are called plasma. Those positively charged gas molecules are then attracted to the cathode, the negatively charged electrode in the vacuum chamber. They are flying towards it and hitting it. And sometimes the kinetic energy of the gas molecule is high enough that it will eject a metal atom from the copper surface into the vacuum. This metal atom, of course, will fly through the vacuum chamber until it hits a surface where it can condense. So we are not heating the metal until it evaporates or sublimates. We are using the kinetic energy of a charged gas particle hitting the surface of the metal and thus ejecting metal atoms into the vacuum. And since we are not relying on heat to evaporate the material, the boiling point doesn't matter. We can easily sputter materials like tungsten or even ceramics. Even though this setup is of course the worst you can use for sputtering, you can see that we deposited some copper onto our glass dome. In a professional setup, they are of course not using two copper wires in a vacuum chamber. To make this process a lot more controllable and efficient, a device called a magnetron is used. So I've spent quite a while to design my own magnetron, and thanks to the help of a member of the AGS in Braunschweig, I was able to avoid a lot of mistakes that would have cost me quite some money. Now that I have the plans, I will use my lathe and my mill to machine the parts. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and just when I was about to give up, I remembered. PCBWay is a sponsor of this channel. Even though the name might suggest that they only produce circuit boards, nothing could be further from the truth. PCBWay are also specialists in 3D printing, injection molding, sheet metal fabrication and most interesting to me, CNC machining. You can simply upload your file to their website and get an initial price estimate right away. They've made these beautiful components for me out of stainless steel, teflon, copper and steel. You will find a link to their website in the video description. Once again, many thanks to PCBWay and now back to the video. This part right here I made myself. It is a ground shield and it's basically just a stainless steel tube with a few holes and cutouts. Before I assemble the magnetron and talk a little bit about the function of every part here, I first have to clean them. Luckily, I've recently got an ultrasonic cleaner. Oh, by the way, there will be a second video in which I in detail cover all of the design considerations for this magnetron. I think including them in this video here would get boring for some of my viewers. With all the parts cleaned, it is time to assemble the magnetron and talk about the function of all of the different parts. Right here you can see what I call the target holder. A target is just a piece of material that you want to deposit onto a different surface. In this case, it is a piece of copper. 
I also bought a disc of titanium and a silicon wafer. As you can see, on the back the target holder has many holes and a channel in the middle here. The hole in the middle and the holes around the perimeter are for magnets. This channel right here is for cooling water. Even though we are not evaporating the material by heating it to its boiling point, this part here will get hot and it is a good idea to use water cooling to transfer the heat away from the target. Otherwise targets which are sensitive to heat fluctuations, for example ceramics, could break. This backplate here sits on top of the target holder and seals the water cooling channel. By the way, it is really cool to see the eddy currents produced when I insert the magnets into the copper. Not sure if you can see it, but it's falling very slowly. Also, it's falling very slowly out. <laughs> With all of the magnets inserted, I can now install the magnetic yoke. As you can see by the corrosion, this part is not stainless steel. It is magnetic. It provides a path for the magnetic field lines of these magnets here and increases the strength of the magnetic field on top of the target holder. To prevent the magnets from jumping out when I get near them, I will use this acrylic plate here to hold them down. To be able to connect the water cooling supply later on, I will screw in these Festool fittings here. At this point it is also time to connect the high voltage cable. As you can see it is just a BNC cable and I removed the outer insulation and the grounding wire at the last portion of it and soldered a separate wire onto the grounding shield. By the way, I think it's one of the best feelings ever to see something you have designed come to life as a machined part. I had to switch glass quickly. I was told in the comments that natural latex gloves are not good for high vacuum applications because they can leave a residue, but since this part right here will not be used in a high vacuum, I'm not that concerned. Since the high voltage cable is connected to this part here, it will be at a negative high voltage potential, which means I have to insulate it to my vacuum chamber. For that I'm using this PTFE insulator in here. Since the screws connecting the top part and the lower part, which is at ground potential, are made from metal, I need to insulate them. For that I have these PTFE insulators here. They go over the screws and prevent them from contacting the lower part right here. Some of you might wonder how I'm going to mount this massive chunk of metal in my vacuum chamber and that's where the member of the AGS had an ingenious idea. This right here is a stainless steel tube with a KF16 flange on the end. Uh. <laughs> I forgot the o-ring with the centering ring. Uh. And this KF16 flange can then be attached to the magnetron using these pieces right here. Since my microphone has failed in this part, I will explain via voiceover what the additional components are for. As I have already explained, the target is placed on the magnetron. To ensure a better heat transfer, it is tightly clamped with this ring at the edge. If the magnetron were to be mounted in the vacuum chamber as it is now and a high voltage applied, plasma would form around the entire upper area. However, we want it to only burn directly above the target. To prevent plasma from forming on the sides, this ground shield is slid over the magnetron. Additionally, a plate with an opening matching the diameter of the target is then attached to this ground shield. I almost forgot to thank Vissel Vacuum, the company that built my vacuum chamber, for making this stainless steel tube with the KF16 flange on the top for me. Thank you a lot. To mount the magnetron in my vacuum chamber and to seal it, I'm going to use this fitting right here. The fitting has two o-rings inside, which get squished when I screw the cap down, and this way it seals against the stainless steel tube. To protect my chamber from getting even dirtier than it already is from all the thermal evaporation experiments, I will cover the inside with aluminum foil. 
before thinking about using the magnetron to code something with metal, I first want to see if it actually fires up. So I have a very crude setup right now. Here you can see the power supply I have built for the magnetron. If you're interested in it, uh, let me know and I will include it in my second video about the design of the magnetron. I have my pressure gauge right here and I have an argon cylinder in the back there, which is connected to this flow meter here. And I adjusted it to get a pressure of around 3.4 times 10 to the power of minus three millibars. And the magnetron is connected to the power supply, I would say, we crank up the voltage and see what happens. I turned down the lights, so you will be the first to see if anything is happening inside the chamber. 100 volts, 200 volts, 300 volts. I don't see anything yet. 400 volts, 500 volts, 600 volts. Oh, oh, you can actually see a faint glow. <laughs> okay, currently we are at 5.6 times 10 to the power of minus 3 millibars. Let's try that again. Oh! Yeah, you can see a plasma. Nice! Oh! It looks like I'm getting some arcing inside the chamber. Yeah. That was a very successful first test, but there are two major problems. The first one is, as you have been able to see, there was some arcing going on inside the vacuum chamber, and that's not supposed to happen. It could destroy or at least damage the magnetron. And the second problem, which is maybe related to the first one, is that my power supply, or at least the microwave oven transformer of my power supply, got very hot. My suspicion is that it either has to do with the arcing inside the chamber, or maybe my DIY rectifier right here. First, I'm going to fix the arcing inside the chamber and show you what I think is the culprit for it. Then I will test it again and see if the problem with the power supply still persists. And if so, I will change out the rectifier. These screws you see right here are at a high voltage potential because they are connected to the top part of the magnetron. That's the reason why they have this PTFE insulation around them. This path here is very short, so I think it is possible that some arcing is occurring between these screws and the base plate of the magnetron. I hope that by putting some Kapton tape above the screw and punching a little hole inside to allow the air to escape, I will alleviate this issue. Okay, second test. Let's see if we still get arcing inside the chamber and if the power supply still gets hot. I can already feel that the power supply is getting warm. To exchange my DIY rectifier, I bought one of those KBPC3510 rectifiers. Please don't judge me for how the power supply currently looks from the inside. I've just temporarily connected everything because I want to test if the rectifier was indeed the problem. So let's try again. 200 volts. Oh, we are at 200 volts. Ooh, and that looks way better than before. <laughs> oh, that looks so freaking cool. 400 million pairs. Oh, and you can, you, Oh, you can't see it on camera, but the green color of the copper plasma is starting to get noticeable. I just noticed something. Um, I was wondering if I'm actually sputtering something. And then I noticed, maybe you can see it, that this glass here is getting suspiciously reflective. <laughs> so I looked on the other side and well, <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely have to get some uh, glass pieces to cover my viewports. But great to know that the sputtering process actually works. Here you can see the chamber from the inside. And yeah, well, it's good news and bad news. That's not coming off. I was able to etch the copper from the glass viewport using some ammonium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. Normally you would just use a shutter to close off the viewport when the plasma is burning so you're not covering your glass from the viewport. The problem is that I want to be able to see what's happening inside and I want to show it to you. So I could use a sacrificial piece of glass or acrylic in front of the viewport but then I would have to replace that every time or clean it every time. So my idea was to just use some clear packing tape from the inside and you would be able to see through but I can just peel it off and replace it to get a nice view through the port. So that's what I'm going to test. I think it's time that we coat something other than my vacuum chamber in copper. So I will just use these microscope slides here as a test piece. 
I have mounted the microscope slides onto the shutter of my rotary feed through because right now I can't use it as a shutter, it's too short, but I can use it to rotate our substrate in front of the magnetron. I have also installed this refrigeration unit here. I don't think the magnetron will heat up that much during my short runs, but it's a good opportunity to test the cooling system. While the chamber is pumping down, let's talk a little bit about my gas supply. As I've said before, I'm using this manual gas flow meter here, which is connected to my argon bottle in the back. But I also have a digital mass flow meter here. And in an upcoming video with a lot of upgrades, I will also install this digital mass flow meter. The green plasma from the copper looks so freaking cool. Okay. Interesting, the adhesion to the microscope slides is a lot worse compared to the adhesion to the viewport glass. As you can see, the surface finish is very rough. I try to improve the surface quality by reducing the deposition rate, thus depositing copper onto the surface more slowly. I also tested other glass surfaces but always obtained the same result. I'm pretty sure it's due to the copper alloy, as it's not oxygen-free copper. However, I can't explain why the side glasses of the vacuum chamber were coated with a perfect copper mirror. If you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments. I will soon get a target made from oxygen-free copper and then report whether it has solved the problem. But now it's time to coat something with titanium. I will just place the titanium target in the middle here and clamp it down just like before. Okay, let's see what the titanium plasma looks like. Oh, that's beautiful. It's not transparent anymore, so that's something. Okay, here you can see the two microscope slides. If you look closely, you can actually see an imprint of the magnetron right here. I think that's due to me being way too close with these glass slides to the magnetron. But other than that, the surface is very good. But let me do a tape test I saw on Huygens Optics channel, which is a pretty cool idea. And as you can see, you can't pull off <laughs> the titanium from the surface. If you have made it this far into the video, you might be interested in supporting my projects financially. You can do that by joining my Patreon. You will find a link in the video description. And a huge thank you to my current Patreons. You make projects like this possible. I have also made these semi-transparent mirrors here by sputtering titanium onto the microscope slides. And I noticed that titanium sputters a lot easier at higher pressures of around 2 times 10 to the power of minus 2 millibars. When sputtering at those pressures, the process is a lot faster and you don't have the imprint of the magnetron on your glass slide. What is planned for upcoming videos? As you may have noticed, I finally have a proper workshop. Therefore, the plan is to expand the frame of the vacuum chamber to accommodate additional accessories, such as the magnetron power supply or a digital mass flow controller. I will also be testing different targets. I still have the silicon wafer and I want to see if I can coat various surfaces with silicon. Sputtering with active gas is also on my list. Just look at these beautiful interference colors of the titanium oxide layers. It would be very interesting to be able to generate these colors deliberately. But the most exciting planned project is lithography. Currently, I'm creating text on the glass plates by creating a template with my 3D printer converted to a vinyl cutter and sticking it onto the glass. This limits the details I can create. By using a photosensitive lacquer and a template, it is possible to create very small features in metal on surfaces. This is useful for things like circuit boards and many other projects. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Other than that, thank you a lot for watching.